let's go back because there were actually three times that you decided music is my life. The first one was at 13 when it was an unrealistic aim. No, it was at 11. Oh, 11? Yes, even younger. So there were really three parts to this. Sister says, when did you realize you, you wanted to be a professional musician? Well, the first was within about three months of playing guitar, I knew this was my life. At the same time, I knew that I was being brought up to take over or be a partner in our father's real estate firm. And this went side by side for 10 years to utterly contradictory aims. I'm going to move into real estate, I'm going to be a musician. That's at 11. Then moving to 17, when my sister had moved to work in Jersey in the Channel Islands, I visited Patricia for a week's holiday. This is wonderful. I had time to practice. I could practice. And I thought, well, if, I, if I'm professional, I can practice and practice and practice. So I went home to Wimborne in Dorset, and in the Fripp Kids Lounge, mother sat down, and I said, mother, I want to be a professional guitarist. And our mother said nothing. She just burst into tears. <laughs> our mother was afraid that when I was 40, I would become embittered. Now, in later years, I said to our mother, when I told you that I wanted to be a professional guitarist, you burst into tears. And St. Edith of the Valleys said, no, I didn't. And this is interesting because I remember that my mother burst into tears and she said that she didn't. But the emotional recording is our mother was concerned. And then at 21, when I was working at the Majestic Hotel, actually before I was 21, at the beginning of 1967, I was driving home from the Majestic and I would get in about half past midnight and put on the stereogram, maybe Radio, Lung, Radio Luxembourg. Now, a stereogram with a novel concept. If you put a record on in stereo, sound came out both sides of the record. <laughs> this was a novelty in 1967 and it was really great. And I was listening to Hendrix. Can you remember the opening bars of Foxy Lady or Purple Haze? Of course you can my life changed. And then I came home one night, put on the radio, and the music was already playing. I didn't know what it was. And there was this terrifying song. Terrifying. And then at the end of it, this orchestra, string orchestra, winding up. <laughs> and then the piano chord. A day in the life. Music spoke to a generation. And I could no longer be a dutiful son. So I had to become a professional guitarist. And on May the 16th, 1967, on my 21st birthday, I did. Now, when Fripp and Fripp were working, a little, a little while ago, a man listened to this story and came up to me afterwards and said, you couldn't have heard a day in the life before May the 16th. 1967, because it wasn't released until June. Someone else came up to me afterwards and said, well, maybe Radio Luxembourg had an earlier than released copy. Once again, I'm not sure. I know that inside, this was all part of a moment extended in time which changed the direction of my life. And one of the stories that we promised we would come back to is why you were developing the ability to play any, any type of music that you were asked. And this was really because you knew one day you would get a call, that an opportunity would present itself and you had to be prepared to take advantage of it. 
you also learned other lessons, one specifically from a bar mitzvah. This has to do and relates to a question we were asked yesterday morning in this room, which is essentially the contrast between the professional life and the, the life of artistry. What is the balance between commerce and art, if you like? A bar mitzvah at the Majestic on the East Cliff, Jewish hotel run by the formidable Faye Schneider. And at this bar mitzvah, the chief rabbi was in attendance. And the chief rabbi really had a very poor grasp of English. And he stood up and said, when you go into your shop, say, hello, God, and you will have good business. <sighs> what the chief rabbi might have said is, may we open ourselves to the unconditioned world that our wishing for the good, the real, and the true moves from conscience hope, faith, acceptance, and love, and moves into a world governed by fashion, advertising, taste, habit, inventions, prices of near substitutes, expectations of trends and changes in price, changes in the distribution of income and the quality and quantity of the money supply, that our professional lives might be mediated by the imperatives of necessity and sufficiency. But this is not what the chief rabbi said. <laughs> Firstly, because he couldn't speak English. And secondly, he wasn't taking a course in economics at Bournemouth College on Niverton Road, 400 yards from the Majestic Hotel. But what the chief rabbi did do was convey a very difficult notion, that of an endless, benevolent, loving grace that seeks to give itself away to an uncaring and ungrateful world. And this he did in 15 words. 12 of one syllable, two of two syllable, and one of three syllable business, but which is, however, pronounced as two. When you go into your shop, say, hello, God, and you will have good business. Let's go back to you're in London, you're unemployed. And eventually, things did look up. Well, let's face it, they weren't going downhill from here. <laughs> On January the 13th, 1969, King Crimson was born in the basement of the Fulham Palace Cafe on the Fulham Palace Road in London. It was a Monday. Our first performance was on April the 9th, 1969, at the Speakeasy Club in London. The Speakeasy Club was right in the center of London and was a watering hole for the industry. It was also known as the Speak Loudly and Coarsely Club. <laughs> and we played there on April the 9th, our first King Crimson performance and went from nowhere to national success overnight. National success because, although there weren't many people there, maybe 100, 150, these were the people that influenced the people. These were the people that said, this is the band. So from nowhere to somewhere in one night. Our 10th performance, which was on May the 14th, 1967, we were playing at the Revolution Club in Mayfair. It was a Wednesday. And this was the first occasion that I sat down on a stool, 
playing in King Crimson. All my background as a practicing guitarist, even at the Majestic, was sitting down. And I found that I could not stand and play well. So I said to the band, I have to sit down and play. Greg Lake, the singer in the band, said, you can't sit down, you'll look like a mushroom. <laughs> I did not point out that in many cultures, the mushroom is looked upon as a potent, virile sign. <laughs> so the management bought me a stool and I sat down. And I believe we played three sets, which was conventional then. And after the first set, we went we went to the, the band area downstairs, and the man came up to me, and he was dressed in a white suit, white suit, and his right arm was in a sling. And his characteristic was of luminosity. He shone. And he came up. Shake my left hand, man. It's closer to my heart. This was Jimi Hendrix. Now, if we leap forward to May 1981, when King Crimson was staying at the Portobello Hotel, Notting Hill, I was walking down from the hotel to Basing Street Studios, Island Studios on Basing Street, where King Crimson were recording an album called Discipline, which was turned down by CBS Epic on the grounds that it was second-rate talking heads. That's just to the side. So I was walking down to the studios, and being something of a bibliophile, I looked into the bookshop just off Portobello Road, and the woman working behind the counter said, Loretta Land, can you remember me? This was Michael Giles, the drummer of King Crimson in 1969. It was his sister-in-law. And she said, can you remember when Jimi Hendrix came to see you at the Revolution Club? And I said, of course, it's my Hendrix story. <laughs> and she said, did you know that I was sitting on the next table to Hendrix at the Revolution? And I said, no. And Loretta said, he was jumping up and down saying, this is the best band in the world. And at that time, we were. For about three months, we were the best band in the world. 